Hey, welcome back to Two Super Guys Trade Socks. I'm Dylan. And I'm Vinny. And today we're going to talk about uh, the most recent and the kind of major news topic in terms of firearms regulation. We're going to relate it to Smith & Wesson stock a little bit and talk about how, you know, whether or not it's investable to me at this point in time, given the current uh, legislative environment and whether or not I think it's morally right. Yeah. We're also going to get into our uh, individual views on a possible gun ban. Uh, you may be thinking, why would we do this on this channel? Are we qualified? No. Uh, do we know what we're talking about? Probably not. Should we be talking about this? No. Uh, and what does this have to do with stocks overall? <laughs> Two stupid guys treat stocks. I can hear you. I like the rant. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I like the little rant there. I mean, this is like the major new topic of the day, right? These yeah. assault rifles or modern sporting rifles, if you want to use the, you know, the the pro gun car, current uh, parlance, if you will. Um, you know, full disclosure: th this was actually a picture I took uh, at one point in time. <laughs> so, <laughs> get, give you an idea of where exactly I stand on this issue. That probably sums it up a little bit. Uh, but you know, interesting idea. Um, and. Full transparency, I have one that I, I yeah. just built because I just I like Legos. So I figured it's like adult Legos. Yeah, yeah, it is. That, building them is incredibly fun. I will say that. I, I went down a little bit of a pathway where I, you know, I built several of them, and then, then I built uh, uh, the AK-47, a couple of those, and then I built the 1919. Building firearms is, is good good time. <laughs> I personally did it because I grew up in a family where there were no firearms, so I knew nothing about it. So I figured, what's the best way to learn than you know build one? I was terrified to shoot it the first time, because I'm like, I did this. Oh boy. I uh, completely. I have the same exact emotion. I will tell you though, that with experience, uh, the table saw scares the crap out of me a lot more than than handling a firearm at this point. Table uh, saw. That, 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 yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> Not good. Uh, but to give you an idea of the current kind of volatility we've seen with this is Smith and Wesson's one year chart, uh, just absolute insanity in terms of volatility. This might as well be a meme stock, you know, like a GameStop's chart, uh, uh, chart probably doesn't look any more ridiculous than this. Yeah. Um, I mean, they've just had headwind after headwind after headwind. And I believe we're going to talk about later, but a precedent has been set, which we'll get yes. into. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, People talk about uh, firearms death and how firearms are now the number one leading ca cause of death amongst teenagers, which is, which is no doubt like a, a complete and utter like travesty. Um, I think the thing that people miss with that is that firearm you know deaths are still largely suicide related. Um, unfortunately, the, the most common, more, most likely person to shoot you is yourself, right? Like that, that's that's what the data basically says. Right. Yeah. So that definitely highlights the fact that there are certainly some serious mental health deficiencies and, you know, firearms are just simply highlighting uh, that, you know, certainly it's, it's a more effective tool, um, but it, it does highlight the fact that it's, uh, there, there's a lack of mental health, uh, particularly amongst teens, like, you know, suicide rate amongst teens has been climbing for, for a while now. Yes. That's scary. Yeah. Agreed. You know, and this chart over here is another thing that's actually been on trend over the last, you know, 20 years or so. Unfortunately, these active shooter incidents, you know, these mass casualty situations, the it's still, you have to remember that these are still very, very rare events. You know, you're talking about 2020, there was 40 of them. Everyone has a different definition of it, too. Um, you know, uh, some of them, they have to actively be engaging at the time, like the police respond. Other times, it has to be three or more uh, deaths excluding the gunmen, like there are different definitions. We can't even agree on the definition of, of what exactly this makes. Um, but you're, when you're talking about something that happens a, a few dozen times a year in the U.S. and to this degree, um, it, you're talking about outliers, right? Like it's, it's not like it doesn't represent the most common occurrence of everyday life. Agreed. It is still a scary chart that's going up, though. I think we can all agree to that. I will say when I was doing my own research, because I think we, we differ a little bit, um, the lack of uh, agreeing on definitions. Uh, we actually apparently still can't agree on the definition of an assault weapon. It's well, pretty wild. 
there is the firearms community definition of it, and then there is the one that's used by the mass media. Right. Uh, in order for the, it to meet the firearms community definition, it actually has to be capable of fully automatic fire. That is the traditional definition, uh, right. going all the way back to like 1943 with the Sturmgewehr made by the, the, the Nazis. Um, it, it, it's really you know, specific in that light, but it's been changed over time. Um, you know, when you look at a breakdown here, this is homicides from 2019. Uh, according to FBI data, by the tool that was used. Um, rifles here represent 364 out of this. You know, basically half the number of fists and hands and feet, so which is, you know, to highlight, these are still unlikely occurrences. And rifles are going to include these so-called assault rifles in addition to, you know, more traditional, you know, granddaddy Biden kind of rifles. Right, yeah, assault ri rifles and then, like, AR-15s, which is, like, an arm of light rifle, right? So... Yeah, I think that's probably part of the confusion there is the uh, the AR yeah, having something probably. else to, to represent. You know, and like it raises the question is like, you know, why why do these things like exist basically? So, for for my personal standpoint, my personal opinion, it, you know, if, if my life is in the line, I'd, I'd rather probably have an AR 15 in my hand than anything else. Um, I, I don't know quite where you stand with that, but like I'm just kind of curious. What, what was your thought as far as if you had to defend yourself, what would you want as your tool? Where where am I? Because that makes a big difference. Your your home bump in the night kind of situation. I'd rather Double have a handgun. Meth tweakers. <laughs> you you rather have a what? Handgun. You would, huh? Interesting. It's more mobile. It is indeed more mobile. Um, however, you know this is actually from the Massachusetts State Police. This is from their own um, modern sporting rifle, assault rifle kind of uh, training, uh, and they highlight why, in their opinion, it is important for. You know, you know, every cruiser to have a long rifle capability, a semi-automatic, you know, medium cartridge, a long rifle in their vehicle. This um, is for Massachusetts police to say why police should have them, right? Yes. Just yes, like, okay. exactly. The, Just the same clarify. justification, I, I think, can be carried over. Uh, but they're basically saying is the 5.56 round, which is what these rifles commonly shoot, um, has a, a lower propensity for overpenetration than, than do shotgun slugs or handgun rounds. Like, that's something to consider, right? You know, if you're using a handgun and bump in the night, um, you know, the last thing you want to do is, is have a round go through the wall and, you know, hit, injure someone that was not involved in this or, you know, love one family member, something like that. True. There is a solution to that, but true. They make friends with rounds, yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of accuracy... It's just a spear tool. You have more points of contact with it, so you have better control over over the actual, you know, directionality and, and, and you know, aiming that sort of thing. Um, you know, this has been brought up as a, a negative in many ways. They talk about high capacity magazines. It's not high capacity. That is standard capacity for that particular platform. Uh, the particular platform when you're talking about AR-15 is a 20 or 30 round magazine. Uh, magazine. You know, if uh, you talk to me about high capacity, I'm going to say it's something above that, above the standard what the, the firearm is designed for. You know, certainly you put a 100 round drum in this, like that unfortunate thing uh, in, in Vegas where that happened. That was high capacity in my opinion, but a 30 round magazine is not high capacity. The okay. Definition's been made up. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's another that's another definition issue. Is no one agrees. Yep. Exactly. And then you know this is their basic conclusion is that the ideal choice for a patrol rifle is a semi-automatic rifle chambered in the five five six. That is their conclusion. You know there are versions of it that are less ominous looking. The mini fourteen. I didn't put a picture in over here. It is out of here. But it uh, functionally it's the same firearm. It just doesn't look as scary. Yeah. You know, Got that's it. What it comes down to. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So how does this relate to Smith & Wesson, right? You're talking about a company right now has a current market cap of $695 billion, trillion 12 months of revenue of $1 billion, net income was $247 million, and free cash flow was $212 million in the last 12 months. That is a 30% yield. Yeah, it's pretty gross. Insane. I mean, I... I and I I'm, still won't touch I, them. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, that, that, there's a reason for it, right? Like, yeah. uh, when you we see a deal scorching this, this hot, there, there's a good reason for this. Um, I, you know, you're buying companies now in the five percent free cash flow yield that are and being happy with it, like a Google. <laughs> that's a five yeah. percent. This is one sixth the price for the cash flow. That's absolute screaming bargain in terms of cash flow. But it's still uninvestable to me. I'm going to get to a point here in a second about why. So, when you bought a uh, firearm, did you buy it through a dealer? Uh, I'm in Arizona. You can kind of oh. do whatever you want. Uh, I did buy it through a dealer. I don't remember 
filling out much paperwork. You don't remember this this form? And it's, you can it's, also it's, just it's go to a gun show and just like kind of grab whatever you want. Yep, yep. That is a legitimate uh, concern, and I, I, I respect that. In terms of, you know, transactions that go through dealers in the United States, which, the, you know, the most recent shooting in, in Texas did, and then also the most recent shooting in um, Tulsa, I want to say, did. And then I can't remember the Buffalo, his backstory as far as firearm goes. But um, you have to fill out this form at a dealer. It's called a 4473. It's a federal form um, by the ATF that it allows for a uh, national instant, like, uh, criminal... Uh, check basically. You know what? So you I, think this... I, did, I did fill this out at the dealer. Yeah, it, it's very very basic form. It, you know, in terms of things you're doing, basically what you're you're going through here is things that would make you disqualify from buying it. Um, you know, th- these things if you ever commit, convicted of a felony, um, if you've ever yeah, been a, considered a fugitive from justice, uh, commit, convicted of, of crimes involving drugs or domestic violence, or currently being prosecuted for any of those. You know, uh, in terms of. Um, you know, disqualifiers. That's what they're trying to get at here, right? So th- this is a form that will make you disqualified as a person. And at the end of the form, the last thing you do here is you uh, have to certify this. You're swearing out, like under oath that this information contained in it is accurate, right? Right. And if you uh, fill this form out incorrectly, knowingly, and submit this, which this form is literally transmitted to the ATF immediately following this, uh, I'm sorry, the FBI, um, the, you are... Uh, you know, putting yourself on notice that this is a felony that's convic- punishable by up to 10 years in federal prison and a $250,000 fine for each time you do this. Right? So you lie, you're committing a felony, and you're right. sending a copy of it to the FBI. Right. Saying, hey, I'm a liar. Right. And I uh, uh, committed a felony. Here's my, here's my documentation. <laughs> uh, so this is an article from a couple years ago, 2018 now. But they're talking about the prosecution rate for those people that actually committed this felony and then sent this information to the FBI saying, hey, I'm a felon. How you doing? Right? I'm going to guess I don't like this number. Oh, it's horrible. Um, oh, okay. 112,000 yeah. people were denied, meaning you know, they filled out this form lying, and the system did actually work in this instance and caught the fact that they lied, and they were given a denial. Right? It's a pretty rare event. Um, out of those 112,000, they investigated 12,000 of them. And they actually started charges against 12 people. That's a prosecution rate of 0.09% for a felony charge that involves a firearm where you sent documentation to the FBI saying, hey, how you doing? I'm a lying felon. Come get me. They only did 12? Yep, 12. 12 people. That's gross. I mean, this data is a couple years old, but 12. So every time someone argues that they need more firearms laws to me, I'm like, why don't we just actually use the pre-existing ones a little bit better, maybe? Yeah, or maybe, yeah, yeah change leadership that, around a little bit, because this is terrible. Yeah. That, that, that's point one, is to use what you have to the best of your ability before you start seeking new things. Yeah, I don't know. no, because uh, if yeah. you just do new things, who says that you're going to follow up on it, right? Because, I mean, yeah. the, the evidence would point to you could add all the new things you want, who cares? Because they're not doing the existing things at all. Yeah, this uh, they call this lying and trying is what they call this. So you lie on the form and you're just trying to see if they catch it. Jesus. Yeah, brilliant. So this to me right here is ultimately the reason why Smith and Wesson, even though they have a free thirty percent free cash flow yield, is still uninvestable to me. You know, the, there has been now a legal precedent where they have kind of pierced this corporate veil and have been successfully able to sue gun manufacturers for crimes that were committed with their products. Smith & Wesson is in some way fortunate that this most recent case in Uvalod, it came out that the shooter had purchased the Smith & Wesson firearm, but the ultimate one that he used in the shooting was actually made by Daniel Defense, not Smith & Wesson. So uh, okay. they're not looking forward to direct responsibility for this particular event. Um, however, the next one, uh, they could. yeah, exactly. Uh, and then you're talking about no, you know, $73 million uh, settlement here. That, that's a very considerable number. That would be 10%, uh, a little bit more than 10% of Smith & Wesson's market cap at this point in time. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like it's just uninvestable. I don't think you can, right? I don't care if they're $7 because there's a lot of shootings in America. And the next one that's Smith & Weston, they could just take, yeah, that's not good. I would not yeah. touch it. Agreed. It, 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 like I said, very tempting from an investment standpoint, a free cash flow yield, but 
uh, to me, it's just not, you know, not worth the risk. It, as uh, like uh, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger kind of thought is, it's not uh, how how likely you are to make money. It's how likely you are to lose money on an investment. And unfortunately, I think the, the likelihood that you lose money on these investments in, in these fire manufacturers is too high. Yeah, agreed. You know, this is another point I wanted to make too. Like the, this whole narrative behind, you know, we need to control the, the items that people have access to to prevent these tragedies. Um, this is a story from a lot of people probably don't know. It's from 1927. It's actually the deadliest school uh, attack in U.S. history, and it was predominantly done with with explosives, not 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 firearm. Um, gentleman was a uh, actually treasurer for the school board, and uh, gentleman I guess is not a really appropriate term for him. Um, and uh, became disgruntled with taxation and then lost an election and decided that he was going to fill the, the school with explosives during the summer vacation and uh, detonate that once the children had returned to school. Um, so that's called the Bath School Disaster, if you feel like Googling it. Um, but ultimately, 38 school children were killed in this attack and six adults, including the, the actual perpetrator himself, when he detonated uh, his car bomb as well. Um, really insane uh, uh, series of events, but the whole idea is that you know, people will find a way to do horrible things. Horrible people do horrible things. That's how it continues to go. And then I think by, you know, more more laws, you're unlikely to eliminate the root cause of this, which is just people having poor access to mental health and not appreciating when, when it's really needed. Okay, that's fair. Before I get into this slide, what do you... Okay, so let's say that uh, a, a 1994 like law on the assault weapon, assault weapon ban comes down the pipeline, right? But there's no grandfathered in ones because last time they grandfathered a ton in. So they say, hey, Vinny, we're going to take your... And they just define it as AR-15s. They don't even say assault. It's just AR-15. Yeah. There's some other variable models of that. Yeah. Are you angry, sad, not angry, okay with it, not okay with it? I, th I think you're going to get an answer that you're really surprised by. So I actually live in Massachusetts, right? And Massachusetts still has the 1994 ban still in effect. So those AR-15s that I possess are actually in compliance with the 1994 ban. <laughs> okay. What if the, the ban is more strict? No, that didn't work. It was entirely uh, stupid in how they instituted it because they did what's called a feature test, meaning that the, there, there are certain features that, that make the firearm um, uh, restricted. And one of them is a... Um, a bayonet lug, you know, a, a flash hider, um, <laughs> a collapsible stock. They're like they're, these are literally the features that are under. The I, I read about a collapsible garbage. stock. There, there's actually a really cool. I didn't put it in here. There's actually a, a kind of a wild thing of a list, just pictures of a ton of AR-15s that I would say look like assault weapons, and those ones were okay. And then they added collapsible stocks to all of them, and then those ones weren't okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's basically my collection. Um, it, it, it's very, it does not change the efficacy of the rifle nearly, you know, much at all. You know, I haven't affixed a bayonet uh, to any of them, put it that way. I, I guess that, 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 that's the major difference. <laughs> right. <laughs> so on the left here, um, those, the red box slides are ones that used pistols only the other ones are assault weapons or what would be considered mm -hmm. assault weapons so las vegas obviously ar-15 a ton of weapons with a 100 magazine 546 injured is like absolute crazy it's ridiculous um yeah. i think so a big um a big person against this would be ben shapiro you know who ben shapiro is i uh, yeah okay so i love the ben shapiro thug life videos they're great yeah, I do think he knows his stuff a lot. I do think he has the most idiotic stance on this ever because he's so mm. confident when he says, well, why don't you just ban handguns, right? Because handguns are, are um, responsible for the majority of deaths yeah. over assault weapons. They are. Right. So my point is how about you just look at the top 13 mass shootings in U.S. history and nine of them are assault weapons. And four of them are handguns. Mm -hmm. So just by banning that aspect, you just saved all those lives. I don't... Okay. It, it's absolutely wild that his point is, well, don't just help a little then. 
let's just get rid of all guns, which obviously people are not going to be okay with. But it is absolutely proof that if you get rid of assault weapons, it will help a little. A little is hard to calculate, but it will help a little. That is a fact. It, and then if you look at certainly... deaths from gun violence from 1993, right before the ban, to right after, it's half. It is a fact. Even if people will, will bring up all graphs of like, well, in this state it was the same. Well, in this state it was actually more. It's, yeah. just, it's just a fact. It, it happened. You also, I think, they, they timed out a, a super cycle of, of criminality, which was really interesting. Um, there's uh, the book Freakonomics talks about uh, abortion and um, criminal likelihood in in the what would be an aborted uh, kind of child and the, how the, there's a great correlation in terms of like a likelihood risk likelihood. So when you get to that 1993 time period, you're you're reaching cre uh, peak criminal age for children that were first allowed to be aborted. I guess under the Roe v. Wade decision, which is fascinating. Like you know, so if the same oh thing we gosh. have this current Supreme Court. Yeah, it's it's crazy, you know, uh, where you're now you're looking at possible reversal of that. So in 15 years time or so, you'd probably see uh, increase in violent crime rate, which is startling to think okay. about. But it fair. <laughs> and like I said, I have an AR-15. I built one. I think it's shooting. I think it's I think it's super fun. Um, I don't have an argument if like they were like. You have to get rid of your guns, and you can keep handguns. Other than, like, honestly, Jim Jeffries' skit on gun control, if you haven't watched it, it's hilarious. Mm. It's accurate. My whole argument is, like, well, I kind of like them, for me. I don't have a point beyond that. Yeah. I can't say it's... it's I, I can protect myself more, because, personally, I'd rather use a handgun in my house. I feel like it's way more mobile. It I, is. I, I saw an argument that for elderly people, it's easier to use an AR-15 than it is a handgun. That's the stupidest. I, that's not accurate at all. And they said that the Dude. recoil is way less. You what? It is. It, it is right because depends, uh, depends on the handgun. Uh, depends on the handgun. Tell me that a 22 like has a ton of recoil. Yeah, come on. That'd be a poor choice for personal defense too. Something. I, I think. Part of the issue with like when you look at this list is that it's like as it's an effective tool. So when it's an effective tool in the hands of someone that wants to do bad, they are more likely to be successful in their mission. Like you know that that's that's what it comes down to. There's actually an interesting point. I, I mentioned I should have thrown a slide in here. Burry actually chimed in on this. Uh, Michael Burry, um, you know, one of his basic argument was that they, they should probably increase the age for. Uh, firearms to 21 was was basically his thought. I I'd have to look at more data in terms of. You know how many of these uh like you know homicides are being carried out by people in the 1821 bracket to see if that was justified but that was actually his possible solution partial <laughs> yeah um i i do recommend if anyone hasn't watched jim jeffrey's gun control skit it's in two parts on youtube it's honestly it's hilarious he even goes into how like well you know then only bad people get guns if they're outlawed right so then he goes into Australia is like, it's $40,000 to buy a handgun on the black market. And at that point, if you have $40,000, you're a good little saver. Keep on saving. You might buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting point. I mean, you're certainly going to make drive things up. I mean, the other interesting point is when you talk about like the potential like destructive nature of firearms. You know, there are over 300,000 uh, fully automatic firearms in the United States that are still legally possessed in private hands. Uh, it's wild. Yeah, so I forget the exact year. It's 1986. So pre-86, uh, machine guns were, were allowed to be held in private hands. But because there's such a limited amount of them and there's so much demand for them, the prices are significantly higher. So if you're looking at like um, a uh, M16, which would be the fully automatic version of an AR-15, you're looking at about $25,000. So these things still exist. They're just so expensive that they're harder to come by. Right. Uh, interesting tidbit. Yeah. I honestly don't know what the correct answer is. That's just my point of view. Once again, like, I don't want them to take handguns. But if they came to my donor like, I need your AR-15, I'd be like, well, that kind of sucks. But all right. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like it, too. It makes me sleep better at night. <laughs> all right, guys. 
Uh, get try and be nice to everybody in the comments. All right. Yeah. 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 Be nice. Be civil. You know. Catch you guys in the next one. Later.